Thank you, Ben. Ben misspoke. This isn't a presentation. This is another panel discussion. So all I get to do is ask questions. Uh, some of the questions that we're going to be talking about and, and discussing are what kind of scour and stream problems do you have right now? So be thinking about this. Some of the scour protection measure, countermeasures that you already put in place and some of the repair type work that you do with these. Whether you do scour monitoring, if there's a number of different scouring, we scour monitoring techniques, and we're just trying to get an idea of what some of the various things are that are used and what some of the issues are with them. And then do you have a threshold for repair measures? When do you go out and fix something when you see a scour issue? So if we can start with uh, one of the states that wants to volunteer and go through and discuss some of their primary scour problems. We've got a list here to kind of start you off. Uh, why don't we start with New York since you're right next to, I guess the, the question is of the types of scour problems that you've had, what types of problems, when you have a scour issue, what's the cause? What's the root cause? You know, are you having problems primarily at the piers, at the abutments? Is the channel migrating? Uh, you know, was the bridge just too small to begin with? Um, I would say... That the, the one issue that I see a lot is um, like scour at, at the abutments and um, it would be like on the, say like bend of a river, it seems to be uh, where you see it the most. Um, I know we have uh, two scour uh, projects that we're doing right now that our bridge crew is gonna do and to I guess fix the problem. We're just doing a um, a six-inch knee wall, you know. So pretty much just coming out six inches, um, using sandbags and and plywood, and just you know filling it with concrete. And so. then, uh, what type of scar countermeasure are you putting in front of that once you've put it in place? Is it primarily riprap. Uh, yeah, yeah, and then to stop it with riprap. Was, was it because it was, wasn't deep enough, that footing? Yeah, we're bridges that were uh, built like 80 years ago, so, you know, different design standards. So. We have a lot of that in New Hampshire also, that they went down, you know, three feet and not always even below the stream level and put minimal amount of riprap in front of them, and that's one of the issues that we have as we're going through. Uh, have you had a lot of problems with the channels migrating? moving around not necessarily where they were when the bridge was built? None that I can think of, but I'm sure we've had that issue. I'm sure tidal scour is probably not a big issue for you. No. <laughs> um, I guess let's go to the, well, I've got you with the uh, thing. So the types of scour countermeasures that Vermont uses is primarily rock riprap? Yeah. Have you used any of the others that you're aware of, either the Ajax or um, you know, tried some of the bendway weirs and spur dikes and that type of thing? Um, let's see, gabions we've used before. Uh, sheets. Uh, we have dabbled in grout bags like after Irene. Um, yeah, that's all I can think of. Have you had any problems with any of the scour counter measures that you've put in place where you then had an issue with them afterwards? None that I can think of. Um, a lot of times, you know, say like after Irene, what we did for her to repair the scour was just kind of like a band-aid until we could replace the bridge. Okay. Does Vermont have any special scouring, scour monitoring measures that they use? There are a number of products out there that I don't know that are used in a lot of New England states, but one of the ideas is if there's something out there that's working that we'd like to know about. Um, other than, uh, you know, the inspector's walking stick, that's about it, you know. <laughs> okay. Uh, do we have another state? Uh, Nova Scotia is looking. So as a province, we're responsible for a lot of uh, local roads and over around half our inventory encompasses timber bridges. Many of those are on timber crib abutments. And so they're fairly forgiving, but uh, often, often they're open face, which are susceptible to scour either through the face of the abutment or underneath. So 
something that we've used in the past couple years has been a, uh, the geo, uh, geofoam. So you get the company in and they spray and they essentially fill all the voids within your abutment. They can get in underneath and in some cases even lift the abutment up to help stabilize it. And it can also help your roadway approaches if, if you have problems with your approaches and potentially even lift the asphalt without having to dig down and repave or whatnot. So that's something that's been relatively successful for us in the past couple of years and we're still using it to on a couple of projects now. Are there any construction issues with that when you're next to a stream pumping geofoam? Are you dewatering when you do it or? We're typically trying to isolate from the stream uh, as much as possible. The foam also, they can't really inject into the water itself, so you need it as dry as possible. But you're, it's not like you're using grout where it can flow anywhere. You, you're not getting sedimentation into the, your water. Um, the biggest thing that we do is we'll put uh, a silt fence downstream just to catch any foam chunks that might start floating away. Uh, but as soon as it comes out of the gun, within seven to 14 seconds, it's set up. So, and it's inert. Uh, environment's been pretty accepting of it for us. So what type of protection do you put in front of your walls then after you've put the geofoam in? Are you just? Kind of depends on the scenario. We're often trying to work uh, at low water levels. So we'll wait till late summer when the water levels are low as possible. And then it, it really depends on what the scenario looks like, but it could be anywhere from just sandbags to uh, deep watering, pumping, your, your standard methods really. Okay. Do you put any protection to protect the bottom of the geofoam after you've finished, or has the geofoam itself become the protection for the bottom of the abutment? Well, the geofoam, depending on how they inject it, can actually just migrate down as deep as the expansion will allow it. Uh, and then in some cases, if you're looking to get deeper, they can actually drill further down in underneath your abutment, and it's just a, a, like a rod, and then they stick their probe down in, inject it, and it expands out into your, uh, into your fill or whatever's underneath your abutment. I guess, uh, what I was asking, do you put riprap back in front of it afterwards to, or is this? Yeah, we typically would just as par for the course for the most part, helps protect, I mean, if, especially if it's a wood, uh, wood abutment, it's protecting the wood uh, and just future prevention of, of any scour that might happen. Do you have any other scour measures, uh, countermeasures that you're using, either the, you know, again, Ajax type articulating block or putting in um, stream training methods to move the stream away from an abutment? Pretty much just the standard sort of stuff that you've mentioned already. We've, uh, in some cases, if we've had a scour underneath the abutment, we'll, again, at low water times, dewater in front of the abutment and cast a false footing, if you will, and put, uh, so it's essentially the same as what I talked about with the foam, but you're using concrete or grout to get in mm -hmm. under the abutment. Um, it seems to work all right. We've also used the grout bags in certain scenarios, um, but pretty much just your standard sort of countermeasures. Do you do any, um, other than the uh, walking stick, any other types of uh, scour monitoring? Uh, do you have any? Uh, bridges in particular that you're monitoring in a special way? Not especially unless there's a specific known problem with the bridge. And if we have a known problem, we're trying to address it within a reasonable time frame. Um, scours pretty much the cause of pro any failures we've had in the past of structures. Scour is a contributing factor. But the problem is when they built these bridges however many years ago, they're often building it as short as they could, uh, building a causeway out and then a short span to cross over the water. So you get some of these larger storms and it's just blowing it right out. Probably four years ago now, we had a, a really large rainstorm event and it washed out 14, 15 structures in this one very localized area. Communities were isolated for uh, two or three weeks they only had access by all-terrain vehicles, so, because um, there's only one road in, one road out. So, uh, a lot of it's just the old, 
old design didn't really take into account potential flood issues and so we're just monitoring whatever we can to try to mitigate mitigate those failures but there's only so much you can do with when the span is so small okay so it's somewhat uh, undersized bridge opening is a part of the problem that yeah. you're seeing yeah okay. but those are structures that are 40 50 60 years old um, Connecticut do you want to go now <laughs> Hi, yep. Steve. This is uh, from Turnpike, New Hampshire. One of your own bridges on uh, 293 and uh, uh, block broke, and we had that scar issue yes. and undermined the uh, wing wall and uh, abutment. And right now, we are treating it with the uh, Cajun wall in front of it, and I have a picture of it here if you want somebody to see it. You're, you're putting in the Gabion mats in front of that one, yes, correct? Yes, we did. Yes. Just want to share that with everybody here. Not so many issues to talk about, but uh, as a design practice, Connecticut uh, designs our structures on uh, rock or deep foundations when they're over waterways. Um, when we do uh, design, or when we get permission to uh, use a scour countermeasure instead of uh, building on rock or deep foundations, uh, we'll use uh, permanent steel sheet piling as a cofferdam, permanent cofferdam. Uh, we may use uh, uh, mat revetment. Uh, I'd like to start using some of the jacks, but I uh, haven't, haven't used them on any projects yet. Um, uh, we have used, uh, in the past, a product called Trilock, which uh, articulates very well um, uh, across, uh, in, in any direction, because it's a three-sided block. Uh, but the key that we found to success in uh, these revetments is towing them in properly. Um, if, if you don't uh, anchor them down on the leading edge of the water, the water will just peel them up and you lose everything. So uh, it's very important to tow them in properly. Uh, the reason that we don't go with them very often is because of the environmental considerations. Uh, as you go to tow them in, you're disrupting more of the environment. Uh, so uh, we, we tend to stay away from that and uh, build our abutments and walls farther back from the channel. As far as uh, scour monitoring, uh, our bridge safety staff uh, do have techniques of scour monitoring, but I'm not familiar with them to talk to you about. Back when we first started the uh, scour issue in the 90s, early 90s, um, we had a lot of structures similar to like, I guess, what everybody had. They just built these small standard bridges. They didn't actually put the footings onto good material. You know, it just was like stream bed, below the stream bed, they'd put it two or three feet. And then over time, that would, the channel would degrade and you'd have an exposed footing. So um, we like riprap. We've done a lot of riprap. Uh, we've also done, in, at the beginning, for the first 10 or 15 years, the environmentalists didn't catch up to us until then. We were putting in grout bags. Um, and typically what we would do is we have a program when we go into a flood watch in a certain region, our inspectors go out and look at the uh, structures. If it's too deep, we have divers go out and inspect it. But once we find the scour, that's where we try to get in as fast as possible before it gets filled back in and we install our grout bags. And uh, if the undermining has occurred underneath the footing, we'll basically use the grout bags as a liner in the bed and then when we get up towards where the footing is, we'll actually stack the bags and uh, put in tubes at the top where we've closed off the void area, that's the undermine area underneath the footing, and then we pump that full of grout. Um, we have done a little bit of the uh, 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 mats sometimes, but we found sometimes they get picked up by the stream. But uh, we have done a lot of grout bags and riprap is our you know, primary. Uh, sheet piling, like I said, we did a, uh, the Geiken system where you drive sheeting in front of some structures, but that's very expensive. Um, scour monitoring, we actually, uh, we do like everybody, you know, scour pole or whatever, underwater divers, we have a, on staff or on uh, contract uh, three dive firms, so every time we go into this flood watch where we actually have uh, significant flows or overtopping of a structure, the divers go in if the water is deep enough. But we do have a um, University of Maryland um, had a test uh, system where they have a bar that they were basically they bore down put a, a tube into the soil in front of the footing and then they take a, a bar that has sensors on it that basically have like little flags and what it does is 
they can, and they have a wire attached to it, and it's a monitoring system. As the channel, as it degrades to the level where these little flags are, they can actually see where the flag is free in the water by, you know, electronic, you know, guruism, you know, the little black box. But as it goes down, it can get to a certain level that we can tell if it's getting close to the footing or not. And that's had some success. Um, it's just a little expensive, but it's continuous monitoring. So all you gotta do is throw on a switch and it tells you where the channel bottom is at the time of any time, during any event or during a non-event. So that's, that's kind of an interesting thing that we found. Um, nothing, uh, unless we're over on the Eastern Shore, we might use sonar for some stuff, but uh, typically it's, we want the tactile where the diver is out in the water. Maine? I guess I'm the scow guy in Maine, so I'll take it. Um, <laughs> give Jeff the problems on scow countermeasures. Uh, we get two main types of scour in Maine. Uh, one's caused uh, near our oceans, where we get silty materials. Um, you've got uh, a lot of abutment and pier scour. We've had a couple failures uh, in those situations, one in York and another one I can't remember. Um, the other one is up in our mountainous regions. Uh, they were all built too small. I think it was one size fits all at that time uh, during the WPA projects of the, uh, of the 30s and 40s. Uh, they seriously encroach on our streams. Uh, we're starting to get more and more intense rain. Uh, couple inches an hour type rains and it comes down off our mountains at a high velocity and it doesn't matter what you put down for riprap, the water's going to go where the water's going to go. And we do have uh, some stream migration in those areas uh, somewhere. It used to go, you can tell from former pictures, it used to go right through, but now it's just hammering on the corner of an abutment and it's, it's, just, uh, it's just waiting to happen. Uh, we're hoping the deck dies soon so we can uh, replace the structure in many of them. Uh, scour countermeasures, we use riprap. We have our own in-house dive team that works with our uh, maintenance crews to go do the work. Uh, they do a real good job. They're able to uh, take some of our scour critical bridges and put them to a four or five so you don't have to go out and monitor them whenever there's a sprinkle. Uh, you just do it on a more normal basis. Uh, we've used Ajax in one area, uh, but the, the choice for the scour countermeasure that's done with our bridge design section, um, and because we don't want to deal with the environmental negotiations, because we don't negotiate all that well. Uh, we do have uh, cable mats, and I'll hand it over to Jeff to talk about cable mats. I, I think, like Ben said, we use those three. We use rip wrap, uh, uh, grout bags, and these cable-tied articulated blocks. The issue I've found with those is we've talked about them rolling up. Um, that's at the, where the interface between, at the beginning, where the mat is. But the other place you have to look for is in the mat, what happens is, is the supplier keeps the tie too long. The tie sticks up, debris gets on it, and in our climate, debris, then ice, then more debris, then ice, and it rolls the mat right out. So not just at the beginning, but in the middle of the mat, it begins to pick it up. So on two contracts, I think we change the spacing on the mat to make it we'll say two inches, very small, so you don't get that loop of excess cable so that debris can get on it. So that is the tip I want to leave you with, is start to look at your mats to find out if your cables are too long and catching debris and part of the reason for them peeling out, so to speak. If you get them short, you can talk to the supplier when they're building them and make them real short and you won't have that excess material. Jeff is right and, and uh, it's very treacherous too if anybody's walked the around a site where you've laid the cable mat with all that tie wire. I mean, you gotta watch your step or you're gonna take a tumble, you know, and uh, I'm really fearing that sometime the kids are gonna be down there swimming or fishing or something and they're gonna take a tumble. And, uh, bags, haven't I, in, I think just within the past 
two weeks they accomplished, I think they did 10 projects. And these are cheap. I mean, you can, you can go in there for four or five grand, you know, and uh, stabilize the bridge and save you a lot of money and a lot of hard aids. On SCAR monitoring what we do, uh, we get our dive team, we got our inspectors. Uh, we don't do any fancy dancy stuff because we get so much ice and debris coming down, it's just going to knock it out and break it. We've tried it once in the past and it just doesn't hold up in, on main rivers. Pennsylvania will mimic what the other states have said. You know, we deal with scour too, it's a big issue. Typically, our scour countermeasures is a, is a riprap, a stream bed paving, or, you know, we're going to put, like Nova Scotia was saying, like a a cur concrete curtain wall, we'll go in and dewater, pump it out, we'll grab, we'll pump in the concrete, just form a wall up in there. And normally, in a smaller type of you know, structure, if we have a couple curtain walls on both abutment stems and are still having issues, we, you know, we like to go back in and do a stream bed paving, you know, if we have to do that. But typically, it starts with a rip wrap. Uh, grout bags have been done before, too. I agree with what you're saying, but. And there's a little bit of other opinion on grout bags at, above my level that we're trying to get away from them, but they are quick. We have used them. You just buy a sack creep bag and put them in there and fill them up. You know. so that's basically what we're at. Scour monitoring. We do, there is a few, I, a couple bridges in the state, and I can't tell you which districts are in. I think they're around, maybe one around the Pittsburgh area, that they have a, uh, like a scour balls. And I think they have the University of Pittsburgh monitoring that. It's like a projector. So, you know, we have the underwater divers under contract. Uh, we don't do that in-house. And that's basically it. Some tilt censoring. There is some censoring in Pennsylvania, some scour critical bridges, and the float out scour poles. Any issues with permitting for uh, channel paving? We will get the permit through DP. Uh, DP 11. General Permit 11, I mean, we'll get them. We'll figure that in, okay. in the process. I was going to say, we have extreme problems getting permits. We we're taking anything out of the natural stream bottom. It's not easy anymore. You know, we don't do a lot of stream bed paving anymore, but we will do it. If we feel it's necessary, we'll get the permitting. We'll do it. It's one of these catch-22s that when there's a storm, we can do anything we want to do under an emergency <laughs> permit. And yeah. we've often joked about the fact that we should just take and have a huge pile of riprap somewhere so when there's a storm we can go out and do all the work we really need to do <laughs> exactly. because we can't get the permits to do them if there isn't a storm and there isn't damage. Right. So. We, of course, have all the problems that, that have been mentioned. Uh, I guess the one thing we've had interesting lately is aggregation where we have a, a uh, a river that comes down and then the grade flattens out and now we keep having to excavate at that location and in some cases it'll be quite a long ways and permitting that is just about impossible so we've kind of more or less turned away from it because of the permitting issue uh, which is kind of too bad but uh, in, in years past people just cleaned out the stream and now it can't happen anymore. So, uh, we have, as far as the types of countermeasures, everyone up there we've done in some form or another. The, uh, I think the only thing I can add that hasn't already been mentioned is the steel sheet piles. Uh, we've had a lot of issues where they weren't anchored to the concrete behind, and the next thing you know, they're, they're peeling out. So. Right. And the last thing I might add is our countermeasures. We do have some uh, sonar connector or monitoring <coughs> that they tend not to be uh, maintained or the information is not monitored and uh, they end up getting damaged by ice but, and so forth and the next thing you know they're not used. So, Really, we don't use any monitoring other than our inspectors. I do know that scour is an issue in New York. Uh, we do have the mountainous and the streams and whatnot. I'm not quite sure about tidal down in Long Island, um, but I do know that we just uh, let a contract that's currently in design and construction for uh, to harden 
105 critical bridges over water. I don't know any of the design details. I don't know what the um, countermeasures are or any of the design. I'm, I assume uh, mainly riprap. I know a few of them have been replaced to you know, widen stream channel. I know they're doing stream channel work as well. Um, yes, with the permitting, all that stuff. As far as monitors, did you initiate that, or was that the Office of Structures on a few of our bridges? Uh, I don't know if there are, are, I'm not even sure if there's any existing monitors working. What's the ones, um, I-88 over the Scahari? Oh, so we're on the Scahari, which, is, which was a throughway way so, Yeah, so they're probably, and I do think there are, I know there's USGS gauges, but I don't know if there's actually monitors, scholar monitors anywhere. There might be something. There's something at the I-88, yeah. And, and Scahari. Um, riprap, we use a lot of riprap like everybody else does. It's usually too light. Uh, it does get uh, drifted away. Uh, the towing in, the revertments of the riprap is key. Um, trying to help to keep it in. I think we've tried everything, really, but for the most part, we're relying on riprap. There is tidal scour on Long Island. Is there? Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so we have the whole gamut, I think, really, to some extent. Obviously, uh, stream flow. Uh, elevation change, uh, when you get the flash flooding is a big problem, vegetation, a stream alignment is an issue, that always uh, it creates problems with the environmental permitting, um, so it's difficult to do that. Debris in the stream, uh, it's a, a bridge preventive maintenance activity uh, we have to keep up with. And, uh, and I do know uh, we also have a flood watch program, you know, um, if there's a flood warning, all the supervisors will go out there and they will monitor the bridges for any, you know, creaking sounds, this kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, that's what New York is doing. In, in New Jersey, I think the scour issues that we're confronting is uh, pure scour, abutment scour. There are also some degradations. Uh, back in 19, uh, in 2008, I think under Dick Dunn, uh, we, we, we initiated a, a scour evaluation and countermeasures. Uh, we had at that time, I think, about 160, 170 bridges that were scour critical. And we evaluated them and provided uh, uh, some countermeasures. The countermeasures we, 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 we provided were based on, on the bridge length, the type of bridges, uh, short span, long span, span, short span would be less than 40 feet long span were, if I would call, greater than 40 feet, and, uh, and we developed uh, some countermeasures. Uh, we used some countermeasures uh, uh, based on the stream bed and then the type of scour that were uh, observed. Uh, we use uh, our preferred uh, countermeasure is articulated concrete block. That's what we use. Uh, we also use some gauges. And, um, and we perhaps, um, if we have enough headroom for longer bridges and uh, if there are deeper scours, we, we, we use uh, sheet piling um, as a protective measure. Um, a, few, a few years back, I think about two, three, four years back, we, we engaged into a, a scour research program uh, with the uh, with NJIT, NJIT was the university that, or that, that, that did that study. And that study is, is uh, had concluded, is complete right now. As a result of that, we, we have uh, reduced our scale critical population from 165 in the 160s to about 100. Uh, with a new method, a risk-based analysis that, uh, method that they, uh, they came up that is specific to New Jersey and um, in, uh, in evaluating scour. So that, we, that, that, will, be, uh, that will be made uh, a part of our policy right now to, to, to evaluate bridges that are scour critical and to see whether uh, we can keep them as a high risk or medium risk or low risk and then we take them from the scour critical list. And uh, this report right now will be would be part, um, we, we, we are initiating um, uh, a process to have that report part of our, of our policy to evaluate bridges. So I 
once, once we get that completed, I'll probably we'll make that available um, to, to you guys. Okay. With the uh, Ajax, do you have any trouble placing them? I know we've used them once in New Hampshire. It was under contract. And one of the concerns they had was placing them in the correct location. Uh, I think originally they had thought they would have divers that would take and help them. No diver would go in the water while there was a uh, map of Ajax hanging over anywhere near them. You well, I, I'm, I'm not uh, really, I'm not really aware of that, uh, but I know that we do use, uh, uh, if, uh, according to the manufacturer's recommendation, that we, we, we will use that. If we can't, if we don't have enough depth, uh, uh, we don't use them. Okay. We use other things. Okay, just with the uh, show of hands, uh, since we're running uh, right about on time right now, uh, from a New Hampshire standpoint, uh, like you say, permitting seems to be one of the biggest issues. And uh, just, you know, is permitting an issue for all the states as far as going in and doing scour repairs or even uh, scour protection at bridges? Uh, just you know, is this something that each state is having, or, is, or are we unique in that manner? So, if a show of hands of people who are having problems, and is there something that you've, is there anything you've done that has uh, made it easier to get the permits for that? That's pretty much how it is. I don't know in the other states, but typically in some sort, some regions of Pennsylvania where I was managing at, you know, we would have local yearly meetings with our local soil conservation society. Uh, Department of Environmental Protection, we would, I would list all my bridge projects, scour measures, <coughs> bridge re replacements, and we would bring them in once a year, usually in the spring, like March 1st of April, and we go over all the projects. So that kind of gave them a heads up. In conjunction with our environmental unit, sending in permits to them, they knew that was coming. Our environmental manager would be there, bridge maintenance coordinator on the local end would be there for PennDOT, myself and the county level of PennDOT and of course DEP and the Soil Conservation Society. And we went a long way with that. I mean, it was really, they seemed to really like that when you were proactive and getting out front with them, trying to show them what projects you had, what's coming up, what permits are coming in, why you're doing it, you know, so we've had success with that. Were you able to get a permit for multiple sites on the same uh, permit, or is this an individual permit for each? Some of them is individual permit. Some of them are uh, quad nine permit, general permit, maintenance permit. The preceding video was produced by the National Center for Pavement Preservation. More information can be found at tsp2.org. That's tsp2.org. Additional support provided by Michigan State University.